Hello, welcome to Cardboard Alchemy Live. This is what we do every week. I'm Peter Vaughn. I'm joined by Rosie in the uh, in our audio, um, putting up your comments, helping you answer questions. But I also want to tell you all on this particular Friday, we have a special guest. <laughs> welcome, Chris Hi. Strain is in the office. Hey. Uh, he's one of our developers, graphic designer, all sort of all wearing all the hats. We all wear the hats. And uh, glad to have you here. We're doing a this. So what we do every weekend is we have a live stream. Whenever you catch this, you can catch it on Friday. Or you can catch it whenever you want to watch about board game news. We basically go over the games we make here at Cardboard Alchemy. We talk about different topics. We might chat out Kickstarters. We might talk about games we've played. We want to hear what games you've played. And I actually have topics today that I'm going to go over. Here is what the show is going to do today. All right. So we are going to have a special guest that we'll talk about, Chris, and his uh, what he does. Uh, we also are going to talk about the Year of the Dragon really briefly because it is the, is the eve of a new year uh, in the Lunar New Year. Uh, we're going to show some Critter merch, talk about that. We are going to play a round of Letter Tycoon. Uh, at the we basically have um, Brad Brooks's game that we play around every session. Uh, we're also going to talk about Wonderland's War because Brad, mm -hmm. Chris, and I got to play that last night, and it was pretty awesome. I yeah, think we can that was good. spoiler. Uh, then we're going to talk about whoops, two topics at once: design versus development, because something that uh, Chris is doing both of here. Um, we're going to then, because Chris is such a big sci-fi fan, go into our top five sci-fi games. We're going to bring Rosie on as well. We'll all do a top five. And then finally, we're going to end with some Q&A. So if you have been building up a question for us on any of these topics or from last week or anything, just shoot your comments. And if, you, and if you're catching this later, put your comments in the video and we'll, we'll answer previous questions. So... So let me... Uh, let's talk about... Um, Chris, you are not normally in Los Angeles. Right? No, no. Normally, I'm from Texas, or I'm always from Texas. You're always from normally. Texas. I'm from, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm from Texas. Um, flew out here to uh, play some games and you know do some dev. And yeah. Like that. Yep. So uh, you have designed how many games? Two. Two more. On You've the shelf. designed a Two lot on the shelf. Yeah. Two on the shelf. Two published. Which yeah. are for everybody, so they know. And, and the expansions. Uh, asking for Troubles, Evil Intent, and Asking for Troubles expansions. Gotcha. So Asking for Troubles, definitely sci-fi. Evil Intent, not sci-fi. Sci sort of sci-fi. It's a master I mean, there's mind. an alien in there's, there. Okay, so you've got two for two sci-fi games. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Woo for Texas, from Allies in Texas. So yep. there you go. And um, the other thing I want to talk about is that you do you have a Monday show. So like this yeah. is on YouTube. You do a YouTube show every Monday night yep. called I mean, uh, The Full 42. We just did our 153rd episode. Wow. 153 episodes is amazing. years now. Yeah. That That's is crazy. wild. I don't know how you don't run out. Of, I mean, like <laughs> you say this, I guess, I guess what's fun about, because you're all geeky things, right? So it could be sci-fi, it could be right. fantasy, it could be board games, it could be movies. It's usually board games. There's but... no end to that kind of stuff. Right. Like you can go, and you guys play games on there too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Make up games and stuff like that. That's great. So um, I love that show. If you guys want to check it out, we'll put the link in the description to go check out the full 42. There's usually top fives or top tens in there, which is why we're putting a top five sci-fi game in this episode. So we're going to do a couple things first, but uh, definitely want to catch that to see what we think are our top five sci-fi. I think what's going to be really interesting about that list is I'm not really a sci-fi person. I don't know if Rosie's a sci-fi person. So we'll be seeing like what someone who claims big sci-fi versus... Although when I said sci-fi, you... You were like, oh, yeah, like I don't know if I have any sci-fi. And we went and looked over your shelf. There's like 20, 30%. I do have, it. yeah. They're like, that's sci-fi. I'm like, yeah, I guess it is. So <laughs> once you start you know, expanding, it's not just Star Trek, you know, it's once yeah. you start expanding your idea of it, yeah. Yeah, what's also interesting, and we'll talk about that when we get to the sci-fi, is what makes sci-fi, because I do have Who Goes There, we love, I love that game, but it's like, that's the thing, is that sci-fi, is that horror? So, interesting to kind of see what is and what isn't, and of course, we are making the game here, and so my shirt is Andromeda's Edge, uh, it's got 
you know, I'm hoping Andromeda's Edge is on somebody's top five sci-fi list. Yeah. I mean, well, it's right behind us too, right? <laughs> yeah. So Andromeda's Edge, uh, we're big into sci-fi this year. We're also big into uh, Critters and we're big into Dragons. So let's talk about all the things. Um, the next thing I want to mention is just a really briefly, since it's the year of the Dragon tomorrow or today, as some people are going to be waking up, um, we just want to say... Uh, sort of we want to wish well to all the people celebrating. We have a lot of partners uh, in China, obviously Sadars in Singapore. A lot of our, a lot of the people we work with are really um, spending time with family right now and cheering about the next year. And I think I just want to say um, we wouldn't be able to make all these games without these partners. And I hope they have a wonderful holiday and they kick off the new year uh, to much success. Can't wait to celebrate the Year of the Dragon. In fact, Andromeda's Edge does have dragons in it, so we will be putting out a game with a dragon this year. So two dragon factions, because you can play the yeah. um, you can play little tiny artisan dragons in space, and you can play the big, big dragons in space. I haven't space. played either one of those yet. You haven't played those? No. Huh, those are really fun. Yeah. The uh, the the tiny, uh, the Flamecraft dragons are, are they're piloting what could be like the Starship Enterprise. Uh, the, the the bread dragon has no idea what the buttons do, um, which Will Brown at the Hungry Gamer says is one of his favorite parts because it's just like you can pretend like, what does this do? And you just launch <laughs> missiles at people. Um, they also have a special ship called the Plushy Prize, which means you can't get attacked by raiders. You can kind of fly through because no one wants to attack cute dragons. So they're like, eh, let yeah. them go. Um, but they also get a credit every time they either buy modules or build developments because they're very industrious and they're very much into commerce. And so they get a credit all the time. The big dragons, they, um, they actually operate out of dens. So if you build on the map, then you can fly from that spot. They don't want to do worker placement. And then they also are into commerce. They want to hoard gold at the end. So if you have credits at the end, they're worth like mega points. Both of those are drawn by Sandara as well. Both of those are done by Sandara Tang. We invited her to be a guest illustrator on Andromeda's Edge. She is all about the dragons. This is her year, basically, because she her whole business is doing like dragons are big and small and everything. And of course, we do have some, some more things we're going to be talking about with Sandara this year because we're working on Flamebound, which is the sequel, the, the yeah. standalone sequel to Flamecraft. Axel's like, I want to play the, the Flamecraft Dragons flying through and drop his edge. It's really fun. Um, that's a neat way to get another one of our games into space. Um, yeah. Something that sci-fi, I think, does really well is uh, we're extending sci-fi's uh, range in a drop edge because there's space dwarves and there's mm -hmm. dragons in oh, space yeah. and there's blobs. And I mean, there's... the last game I played werewolves or something. Or yeah, just wolves. wolves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're, we're going all over the place. And so sci-fi could be anything. But we'll get to that. Let's talk about what um, we uh, we want to talk about. Let's do a little Critter Kitchen shout out because you know you're developing Critter Kitchen, mm -hmm. so that is also coming this year. Um, and we just played just to talk about what we did last night. We played a seven player game, two of them, two seven player games. The designer, uh, one of the designers, Peter and uh, and Brad Brooks was here. How do you feel about how that went? So. I lost horribly on both of them, but <laughs> so failed Critter Kitchen. I think it went extremely well, surprisingly yeah. well. Yeah. Because whenever you do seven, you know, whenever you see something like oh, seven players, like I bet it really doesn't play that. Way. Uh, Peter uh, or Blue Peter, as I call him, <laughs> yeah, uh, did There's such a, a great job of. Uh, well, and Alex too did mm -hmm. both a, a, such a great job of like making it work with six or seven. It's. I was very surprised. Really excited by that. In fact, if everyone doesn't know, Asking for Troubles, which is your game, plays up to seven. Yeah. And one of the things I've been shouting out about it for years is you don't have strategy games that play up to seven. You just don't, right? I mean, you have a couple um, that you can say, oh, Between Two Cities is a strategy game. We can like play all seven. I love that game. Um, most of the time, it's a party game that you have to get seven, right? And yeah. it's because of what? Turn length, I guess, right? Yeah. You can't. You don't want to wait for seven people. And the trick is, and I think Critter Kitchen hits this, is that you get it at least 90 minutes or less with seven people. is amazing to be yeah. able to do that with a strategy game. Yeah. Uh, we played one game where we had restaurateurs. We had one game where we didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, we tested different critics and different zoo chefs. 
Uh, it's going to be really great. I love the fact that if you have a big group, you can sit down and play Critter Kitchen yep. just about an hour and, and change. So, but I want to show some other things about Critter Kitchen because as we're developing Critter Kitchen, we're also working on the merch for Critter Kitchen. And this is something, this will involve Rosie a little bit because um, we had to work on, um, oh, I, actually, this is an image that, <laughs> sorry, spoiler. That's different. This is not Critter Kitchen. We'll go into that image in just a minute. Um, but let me bring up, this is uh, something that we were working on is the cookie cutters, right? And we sent a set of cookie cutters to Rosie, who has done a lot of um, baking. Yeah, you're not in. No, 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 no. Talk about that. <laughs> Talk about the cookie cutters. <laughs> um, so Rosie's done a lot of baking. Rosie is really familiar with, um, uh, first of all, as a cozy gamer and as a baker, kind of feels like the right person to be looking at these. So what we did is we sent her the designs for the next ones coming up. The teal cookie cutters are all the zoo chefs. And Rosie started making some notes on those. Um, let's see if I have another one of these images here. Sort of just really helpful to go to Sundara and say, this might not work as a cookie. Like this line right here, this this space might get the, the dough trapped in it. Mm -hmm. And so what amazingly what makes a meeple and what makes a piece of art <laughs> and what makes a cookie a totally different ball game, right? Um, do we should have should we have teeth on the dolphin? Um, how are we going to get the spaces to work out? How's it going to look like a good cookie? So, really interesting part of it. Um, after we did this, we did um, we went and did like another pass with Sundara and another vectorizing pass with their graphic designer Dwayne. So we're kind of getting the cookie cutters all set up. And then also on the merch front, I wanted to show two images of the bag because. I tested the bag and I put games in it to show how big this bag is that we're making. So it's got the grocery store on one side, it's got the waterfront on the other side. And these are three ticket to ride size boxes, biased which ones I stuck in there. Yeah. But you can take that to game night. Now, the Deluxe Critter Kitchen is uh, a little bit thicker than mm -hmm. that. So it might be a tight fit, but you but you might be able to still get three, three games in there. But I want to show one more, which is you could also stick Andromeda's Edge in there. Oh, that's cool. Totally fits the deluxe box of Andromeda's Edge and has room to spare, I will note. You could actually get another game in there. You could get a bunch of small games in there. This picture tells me that there's a bag in here somewhere I can steal. Yes, there's a bag <laughs> in here. Like if you're flying home, you could be like, what do I take back to Texas? You'd oh, be like, where's that bag? I'll take this bag. Um, all right. So that's what I want to show on this front. Let me go back here for a second and we'll see what our next topic is. Well, we're going to play Letter Tycoon in a minute. Uh, we could get that, get that going right Green now. Green team. Yeah, it's funny because in Letter Tycoon, which is designed by Brad Brooks, there are, um, we're playing two different teams. So what we've said is, that uh, there's an orange team and a green team because the, the game has those kind of colors going on. And Chris has sort of decided to play on the green team. Um, and it's been really kind of funny because what we're doing is the orange team plays while we're here online. And then the uh, the green team can play. The away team can be like, wow, let's go on the YouTube comments and come up with words. And anybody who plays on either team can actually uh, get... Um, to you can win Ladder Tycoon. So if you jump in now and you come up with a word, then you get to um, possibly win. And also if you come in later, you can play on both teams, Chris. Oh, I'll just be a traitor. <laughs> you just <laughs> won't know which team. He'll be like, Whichever wins, I was the traitor of the other one. Oh, uh, you're going to sabotage. Yeah. Okay, so let's go over where we stand. I believe we're a couple weeks in. Um, we have a score right now of... So the orange team has 16 points and green has 20. Now that looks like green's ahead, but you actually, at the end of the game, 45 points is what triggers it in a two-player game. So when we hit 45 points, then there'll be an end game, but also you get to count all your coins and your stock. And so orange has 10 coins in the bank and nine stocks. So they have 19 more points on top of the 16. Mm. Green has only five points in the bank. So... Green is on paper looking like they're ahead, but you're going to need to you need to find some ground here. In addition, let's talk about what happened last week in terms of what people bought and all that kind of stuff. So uh, Orange last time around uh, played a word, which was pretty good on the stream. We came up with biathlons 
And not only that, but we have a fake S that we can add because we bought a Z. That's one of the powers of the Z. So you can add an S. So that made a nine letter word, which uh, scored really big, scored uh, $6 and three stock. That's one of the reasons why they have so much money in the bank. Mm -hmm. And then chose to only spend two of their dollars on the B. So the B also has a power that you can begin and end your word with vowels. So that's a tough one. So now Orange owns the A, the D, the Z, and the B, and has 10 bucks, but uh, and also avoided with biathlons using any of the letters on the green team's word. That's really strong, not giving the green team any money. Then the green team answered. Uh, this was a fun thing. The green team answered with a couple of different words, and this particular batch of words was not only came up with Martin in our audience, but also you and Brad came up with this. Mm -hmm. In fact, we were almost going to use, we love all the suggestions. There was a really good suggestions for tact and fit. We almost used it because tact would have gotten a stock. The reason why we didn't is because the A and the D and the and the B. No, it was, it was tact and fib. That's what right. they were going to do. So they were going to have three of them. We were going to use too many letters that the orange team owns. And so what would have happened is, yes, the green team would have gotten a stock, but orange would have walked away with too many bucks. And we can't. And, and as far as the green team is concerned, you can't let orange have any more money. <laughs> so Mike, in fact, earned. Uh, now, the reason why the green team can spell two words and not one is because Green special. early on bought the V. The V allows you to buy two words. And by spelling might, in fact, actually, uh, the decision was made to buy that K. As long as the K ended up in your hand again anyway, buy that K power, which gives you a double score if your word only has one vowel. And in this case, if you'd had it for this batch of words, fact would have, right. would have scored double. So with all that said, catching back up, the patents uh, that have been bought so far can see who owns what orange owns the a and the b now and the d kind of buying up the early part of the alphabet and the end of the alphabet and then green's in there with the e the v the k and the s you gotta watch out that s is really popular in the deck so if green owns the s and orange uses a s uh not the virtual s but uses an s improper then they're gonna have to pay all right, let's go into the word here. So orange was, so the when when green used everything but the B, it was left in the community letters. So then the new community letters that got dealt out are B, U, and E. So orange can now use those letters, but also gets a hand of new cards. We didn't discuss if they were going to drop the E, so I kept it. And now orange gets dealt the S, the W, another S, the green team is very happy yep, about this. That's good. A T, an I, and an N. So that's what we're working with right now. We're going to form words. If you have a word with these letters, you can let us know. Um, Michelle is asking, with the K and V, could you potentially get double points for both words? Good question. You can only use each power once. So no, you can't K, K. You can't like do two. You can use the V to do two words, and you can use the K to get one of those words to pop with the one vowel. Yeah, Brad's. And Brad's right there with the rules. We got Brad Brooks in the house. <laughs> Brad designed this game. I helped develop this game. Chris plays more than both of us, I think. <laughs> so, um, All right. So let's talk about what we're going to move around here. So we've got Mark shouting out the word sweets. Too many S's. You ought to just pass I mean, this is a dangerous word, Mark. I will tell you that because even though we could use a virtual S at the end, that's paying out. That's actually earning. Uh, so if we had a virtual, let's pretend this is virtual, right? That's earning $4 and a stock, but it's paying out for the two E's and the S. It's paying out three bucks to the yeah, green team. It's good. One. That would give them a lifeline that, um, you know, got to watch it. Let's see what else we got going on here. Let's go with your first thought. Go with your first thought. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, well, the problem is there's just so many. How do you get another vowel in here, right? These suits, right? Suits. suits. Now, the nice thing is, okay, let me tell you another nice thing here. Good so, show. orange has a bunch of money. Ten dollars is in the bank, so you don't need to make a big word in order to buy a good letter, right? 
So here, suits would, uh, we could use a virtual less for that. So that would pay out only $1 to green and it would make $3 for mm -hmm. orange. And then we would, uh, Orange would be able to buy the I or the T, which would be good. If you go with Sweets, you could buy the W. Oh, by the way, Sweets uh, would, would be good too. But it's, the problem is it would bring in another letter for, sorry, Suits and Sweets are two. Axel similar. wants a reminder of the powers we have. So the powers that we have are, so we have the B power, as worth talking about. The B power means that if we can begin and end with vowels, then like, if uh, let's see if we got one, um, I can only think of a fantasy thing. Ents, <laughs> like um, if we could think, if we can get uh, something to begin and end with a uh, vowel, then we're going to score double. That's the B power. The other power that we have is that we have that virtual S that we can add uh, that does not give the green team that point. So we can add an S to anything. Uh, we've got two S's, which you Although can use. if you add the S, then you won't have a vowel. The sure. End. The B and the S, the B power and the Z power do tend to conflict because you're going to either go for that big word where you're going to get the vowels bookending it or add that virtual S when you want to pluralize something. Unite. Unite. Oh, there we go. So this is an example of getting those vowels in there. So if we form the word unite, it's a good, good suggestion. So we take that S out of there, right? So that would be a three-letter word, which would then pop it to six, six, six bucks instead of three bucks. Five-letter word, yeah. Five-letter word pops it to, uh, so it's a $3 score, and then we would get $6. And it uses only one letter for green. Don't like it. <laughs> Green, te green team is officially saying, nah, nah, I don't know about that. Apparently, Ooh. we can spell business and witnesses. Let's, 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 oh, let's go and look that look that up. So we could also go, oh, witness as, no, we, we don't, we could do. It's a lot of these. Of, uh, wait, 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 wait. Could you do, <laughs> you could do witnesses? That's what Michelle said, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's a big word. Hmm. Let's see if that's worth it, right? Because we were, of course, we got a lot of S's and E's in there. So what that means is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, plus one more is nine. That's six dollars and three stock. And then that's handing the orange team uh, four, mm. or handing the green team four bucks. Oh, yeah. Go make the sweet. So... <laughs> Let's look at that for a second. So we could either do, I think this is kind of the same thing, right? If we do in Unite, we're doing a $6 advancement, but $1 back. And this one, we're doing a $9 advancement with, you know, with uh, four off. So it's five. I think it's five either way, right? Mm. Um, Unite is a $5 up kind of a gain and Witnesses is a $5 up kind of a gain. Um, the only, let's see. And what it leaves, though, it leaves the B for the for hopefully the green team to use because we want them to use the, the B letter. So what was the other one you said? Witnesses and there was something else. Um, business. Business. Now, business throws back in the B. So let's see what it's worth, worth talking them all out. Business. Yes. <laughs> I can spell. <laughs> Uh, buses. I mean, Buzzing I was, I was actually just thinking about what else there is. Or just bus. You just do bus. Just spell bus. Yeah. Yeah. I feel there is definitely a traitor in your midst, you know, that's... <laughs> Um. Well, if we use, if we did unite, I'm just saying what letters would be left for um, what was in the unit, the community was it was B and E, and U and U. Mm -hmm. So if we did um, do unite to get double, we would of course be leaving the green team with a juicy vowel to use. And so the B. and the B, but going back to witnesses, it really does mean that it's the same. Uh, it's the same gain, right? It's the exact same gain um, 
Oh, geez, it leaves a U, though. And oh. it's fun to make really long words. It is fun to make really long words. What is everybody voting we do for the Orange Team? Uh, either Unite <laughs> or Witnesses. Brad says, I wouldn't value a stock quite as much as $1. Oh. Interesting. Mm. You're just dropping these random things, Brad, for us to pick so up. So the designer of the game is saying that... I agree, Brad, but we're green. So, <laughs> so dollars are, are actual, uh, not only are they points, but they're points you can spend. So right. we're going to say that that's better. So we're going to leave all this stuff out. We're going to go with uh, Unite. Mm -hmm. I think I have a traitor. On the... <laughs> <laughs> Letter Tycoon with a traitor. Uh, so we're going to spell Unite. I'm going to write that down. Um, Unite is a five-letter word, which scores $3. But because of our B power, it makes it $6. And here's the next question. With $16 in the bank, you could buy anything except you can't buy the E because it's already owned. So this leaves U, N, I, or T to buy. Does the orange team want to have a consonant or a vowel? I think the two biggest, I think the, I mean, I'm going to just assume U is out. And these are the choices. Do you want to have, uh, let's spell knit. <laughs> um, Need a K. Vowel. Every gamer is shouting for vowel. Keep the uh, vowels away here. Mark is shouting for T. Mm -hmm. So we got a constant of vowel. We need a tiebreaker vote here. If, if anyone watches Countdown, that's literally the show you're going consonant, consonant, yep. vowel. Brad, consonant, Brad, please, Rachel. Brad is on all teams. I support all Letter Tycoon players and especially purchasers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely a traitor. <laughs> We got another really... vote for I and another vote for T. So we are currently tied. No one's going for N. No one, everyone hates the N. Let's get out of here. There's a lot of N's in there, too. Like I six know. of them? Well, the frequency chart, let me bring up the frequency. If you look at the frequency, the oh, it's on the card, too. But uh, T is in six. there six times. That might be an error, actually. Is that right? That doesn't seem no, right. I think that's right. Six. Mm -hmm. N's in there six. I's in there nine times. I think that might might influence this vote we've got three three votes to two right now for i so all right I... <laughs> I think i is taking it because how many eyes do you have it's so frequent in the deck <laughs> so we'll buy the i everyone say i <laughs> so then what that means is the letters that uh so let me go back here for a second the letters that um we're still in the community marketplace are going to be the B and the E, which we'll leave for the the uh, green team. And last decision Orange has to make is, do we want to keep SSW in our hand? Maybe just one S, because double S is quite handy to stick on the end of things. Uh, yeah. Now S pays out them. So I would argue for, yeah, definitely not two S's. <laughs> Brad's right there with the puns. The eyes have it. <laughs> <laughs> so Axel's saying keep the W. I'm so I'm hearing so far a vote that we ditch one of the S's and hold on to an SW. Is that I think right? There's a slight delay. <laughs> yeah. I'll give everybody a second in case anyone wants to do more. And then we'll go into the green team's word. And then we'll go into our topic, uh, the sci-fi topic. So uh and well, we can catch up on if anyone has any more votes on the on the S and the W. You can tell me, and I'll I'll adjust for the stream. If there's like overwhelming, don't keep the S. I'll ditch it. Just don't listen to this. Meanwhile, let's go over to uh, green. So now, of course, there's the B. Let's actually put the, the e. e back. Put the E back here. Image uh, E. Get that back in there. Okay, so the green team's got, this is the board. So we're gonna have to deal out one more letter for the board. And so the extra letter that's dealt out for the board is a G. So there's a word right there. <laughs> <laughs> and then green had nothing in their hand. So then let's deal out a fresh hand to seven. We have an I, oh, that's good for the orange team. R, S, a, O, F, and another R. So 
Hmm. We're going to leave this up. If you are watching this and you want to play along, you can make uh, the green team has the power to make two words. You can make any two words out of that. Um, go ahead and give your best suggestion. You can banter back and forth with Chris and Brad and myself in there in the comments and we'll come up with a word. <clears throat> also, if you're going to come up with words, try and suggest which letter you would like to buy as well. Up for, uh, up for grabs would be the O, the R. You already own the S as the green team. You already own the E as the green team. Yep. So, all right, we'll uh, we'll leave it there. Thanks everybody for playing Letter Tycoon. Letter Tycoon is actually this new version of Letter Tycoon. Let me go back to um, this this little box. Uh, do I have the lid anywhere? I do have the lid here. Yeah, let's hold it up. Let's go back to this. This version of Letter Tycoon. I'll let you hold it up. Is uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's now on Breaking Games' website. It's $25. Um, it's the travel edition, basically. You get um, what you get inside Letter Tech, which I really like. We did this from the, the starters. You get these like really nice wooden, um, wooden coins for your money. They're really fun. And then you also get uh, cardboard stocks that you can hold on to. Don't forget the best part. The Zeppelin? The little Zeppelin. <laughs> the little Zeppelin that comes in there. Because it's the 1920s. It's the booming industry. Uh, the whole uh, game is in sort of an Art Deco theme. And you're a capitalist buying up the letters. I made that Zeppelin. You did. You modeled yeah. that Zeppelin. That's another one of your many hats that you wear is a modeling hat. So I appreciate that very much. That was a fun Zeppelin to make because you were like, how many little details could I put on the bottom yeah. of the Zeppelin and still get that model to work out? Yeah. All right, so I believe we're going to move into our top our topic about sci-fi. But I want to bring back up. Uh, actually, no, we're doing right before we do sci-fi. We're going to talk about uh, Wonderland's War and Design and Dev a little bit. But since since we did spoil it, I want to bring up the picture that we had up there. Um, while we were in the studio getting ready for this, Chris sketches this out like this is not just um, like he didn't have that pre-done it was just here you can hold up the sketch yes. now um so there we are i love the fact that you bring a lot of talents to this thing and i would not be able to whip up a, a sci-fi drawing there but you were busy getting stuff ready, i was so. yeah I getting ready, stuff ready. uh it's so great to have that um do you draw like a lot or well like i was i was saying telling you before the show like i haven't drawn a lot oh i gotta stop hitting the camera <laughs> it's fine i gotta uh, I haven't started drawing a lot uh, recently just because I've been busy with so much other stuff and all, but I kind of want to get Sorry back into it. So. <laughs> <laughs> stuff I enjoy, right? Yeah. But uh, I want to get back into it just as a hobby and stuff. Yeah. So, really cool. uh, yeah, you normally I draw on the iPad. Now. I remember even talking about Letter Tycoon when we were first trying to come up with the Letter Tycoon uh, concept. We had come up with this idea to have uh, Tycoon Powers, mm -hmm. which is an expansion that may or may not ever see the light of day, but it's something that Brad was working on. And then you drew sketches of Brad as a tycoon. And yep. I remember that. That was a yep. lot of fun. I still have that. Uh, yeah. I, I might be the only person that has that expansion. <laughs> <laughs> Never made it. Yeah. that we, we came out, uh, fun fact, when we were doing Letter Tycoon, and actually this is part of our next topic too, design and development, right? So Brad designs the game. The developer is not maybe supposed to do what I did and bloat the hell out of the game, which is what I do. But I like to explore all the options. Like, could the game go here? Could the game go there? Um, sometimes during that process, you ask questions and then it defines what the game is. Because some people, some someone who played it wanted to make Ladder Tycoon a party game. And we're like, no, it's not a party game. Um, we had all these power ideas because as we there's you can already tell there's letters with powers on it. And a very popular game came out at the same time, Paperback, and they have powers on mm -hmm. every card. And so we started feeling that kind of thing of like, should there be more power? Should there be more things you could do? And Brad came up with three different uh, assets to an expansion, which later became this thing that we carved out of the game. And our theory for carving it out of the game was we thought, it's too much at first. Like you have a global power and you have like handicap cards that you can kind of give someone, which we're calling regulations, to restrict them and this expansion felt like well i have to learn all of this while i'm getting used to the game so what we decided to do was take it all out of the game 
so that we could focus on the base game and let the base game shine. Now, one of the downsides of that is the expansion has never been published. It's been cards that we've literally almost for 10 years had in the back of our heads as could be could be something that we work on with breaking games, or it could just be that thing that never was, which is what makes some people want to put... I'm using this as an example because I put so much in Andromeda's Edge that you at one point said, as yeah, so you're coming in looking at it from a dev standpoint, do we want to put that much in? Right. Or do we want to leave some to grow the thing, right? It's right. a fascinating topic. And because you've done design and development, you, you've done design, we talked about your games, you also did the development in Critter Kitchen. So where do you think... Like to you, what is like some so, of the differences of those two? Um, as a skill designer, sets? you want to, you kind of want to pile on. You're like, oh, this is cool and this is great. And because, like, if I add mechanism A to a game and then I add B and then C, and I'm growing with that. So mm -hmm. I don't see how big it's really getting. Oh, and so, so the developer's not supposed to bloat it. They're supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> well, well but, but the designer keeps adding more and more to the gameplay mm. now it might not be content but it could be but and sometimes it is but it gets this huge thing and i feel like as a developer i need to come in here and Shop. start cutting things down to make it refined you know uh, go to more of a minimalist thing so what i try to say like how can we get the awesome feeling that they want with all this stuff but with less learning less you know, mm -hmm. get them right into it, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I think the relationship between a designer and developer, the most important thing for it is that, um, like, I know there are some cases where the designer is a developer. In fact, I was for my game. Yeah. Um, but I think it's best if it's two different people. I do too. Because you need two different perspectives at it. And teamwork yeah. always kind of, you know, yeah. you, you get teams working together. I mean, this is, this company is a great example of that where you get different perspectives of, um, it, you know, you, you get tunnel vision whenever yeah. you're making something, even a designer or a developer, you're you, way. you can't see it anymore. Yeah. Right. And a developer comes at it from a completely different point of view than a designer. And, the, the developer, in my opinion, their their best weapon is empathy because you have to put your head into the mind of a person who's playing it for the first time mm -hmm. or a person who's playing it for a tenth time. And right. is it still fun? All that stuff, right? Yeah. Uh, and the audience, like sometimes you're developing a game that is not your type of game. So you yeah, have to change. Yeah, you have to change your... Yeah your mind you go okay i'm not me i'm the audience now mm -hmm. and i gotta make this game awesome for this audience that kind yeah of like you might not enjoy fighting but then the game's got fighting and you have to kind right. of like embrace that yeah you have to go like why do people who like, like fighting game. what makes them like it and let's put more of that in there yeah. yeah i there's definitely development is a very hard job i remember when i first saw manny's design sparkle kitty he had about like seven things going on mm -hmm. and i was like they're all fun i want all of them but i think i think the the audience that's gonna play this game should just get like three cool things three cool things and then that's it and that was hard to kind of like but yeah. with that lens we were able to kind of pull stuff back out of there and just focus the card game right I think letter say can we cut those things out? I think for the better for the main game to just shine. Yeah. Yeah. Even after all these years, I think it's still best the way it came out instead of having that extra stuff in there. But you accuse yourself of bloating games. I do. But you don't bloat it with mechanisms. You bloat it with content. Sure. So which is really easy to grok. It's like Here's another faction. Here's another faction. Here's a like that's fun stuff to add into. That's not really sure. what I'm talking about cutting, right? So I, I wasn't True. saying like, you know. Yeah, uh, and Drama's Edge was a tough one because I went to Luke. Well, Luke and I worked from the beginning. And Maximus came on, and then we were like, okay, what do we want to make here? And what is the, well, obviously we knew what the audience, what what the audience was gonna be. And I um I pushed Luke and Maximus to be like, what else can planets do? How many more things can you have? So I feel like I was deliberately doing that. But of course, it's difficult in a crowdfunding sense, I think, because crowdfunding has an appetite. Crowdfunding audiences want to see, and Critter Kitchen was 90 stretch goals. And I think some of that is, um, just bring it on. But but that makes me actually wonder now the difference between uh, developer-publisher, because we had an interesting dynamic where 
I gave you the job of developing Critter Kitchen and you said, okay, I got it. And then I would throw you curveballs like, and we're adding six and seven. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, what? Well, you know, it, it, creating a game for, let's say, a Kickstarter audience versus yeah. a shelf audience, that's a completely different thing. Kickstarter expects more stuff. Yeah, yeah. They want more content. They want, you know, they want yeah. the bigger bang for their buck. Sure. And so in a way, it's expected. Yeah. It's fine, you know, that it's allowed or whatever you know what i mean like it's the line gets faded yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. so interestingly uh just to talk about this in terms of whisperwood this is a game we've talked about a little bit on this channel you're going to hear a lot more about it as we get it into development but it has been designed by chris aaron your partner and also brad brooks Mm -hmm. and i then get to wear the hat of developer because you can't because we believe we have the same thought on shouldn't uh develop your own game i'm excited to see what you do once you start getting in there and chopping like, all of it now i love oh, I, you're gonna be like give me more of this give me more of that yeah that's put us the, the task that's <laughs> the thing is it is going to crowdfunding so it is yeah. gonna be like i've already uh i've already pushed you you all one direction because there were there, there's these golems we don't have the the golem art behind us but there's these ancient golems and you guys had four in there and i was like can we have more golems? which was we all went Yes, we can. Like it, and then we just started going. Like I, that's great direction. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun to talk about. Uh, let's talk about another game that we played. So another, moving on to the, another topic. Um, speaking of games that are kind of bloated but kind of awesome and kind of the productions off the hook, the games got mechanisms all over the place. We just played Wonderland's War last night. <laughs> and uh, speaking of Whisperwood, it's going to be a bag builder. This is another bag builder. So it was really good to play this game. I've been waiting to play this game forever. And I'm just going to say my reaction out of the gates is it was amazing. I think the production was, it's, it's it's the kind of thing we like to do with this company. When you open the box... Manny Tremblay's art just was mm. gorgeous. gorgeous. The Cheshire Cat, the Allison is just gorgeous. And then the pieces, uh, Druid City puts on a run for our money in terms of deluxification, right? You've got these these uh, these chips, the the poker chip f- vibe. Yeah, they're like smaller poker smaller chips. Smaller poker yeah. chips that are That's for good. all your tokens. And there's a game trays in there to store it all. And then there's minis for all the different the pieces. The bunks. Oh, great. So Chris is going to grab it so we can show it. Um, it's not just the production, though. It's not just all the detail. It's the fact that the game was really good also. So just a brief version of the game is that you uh, are playing three rounds only. Uh, yeah, there's the box, by the way. It's fantastic. Um, but it's just every little bit of the art that I think is... The thing about this art is like, you know, if you just tell somebody, I'm just going to put the head of the cat on the cover and that's it. <laughs> You're like, that doesn't sound like enough. But, you know, this is such a good design decision. Yeah, to just make it. A so the game thing. really briefly, you're playing three rounds and you're and you're you're all going mad. It's a tea party kind of thing. You're all at the Mad Hatter's tea party. You're playing Alice and the Mad Hatter and the Cheshire Cat um, and the Jabberwocky. And you are playing three rounds of a tea. Uh, you're basically having a tea round and a war round because you're yeah. battling each other. There's cards flying and there's, you know, different. There's all the characters from the Queen of Hearts kingdom and so forth. Um. Similar to Grim Forest, I feel like James Hudson managed to really, and it's also the same designer, uh, Tim Eisner, uh, actually the two Eisners, right? Um, and Ian. Mm-hmm. So it's got that same vibe that I saw in Grim Forest of like all the characters that you're in love with, like all the lore, all of that's coming in. And then um, you are balancing madness. And as Axel says, the shards mechanism is that madness. You can do cool things, but it's going to cause you to go more and more mad. And that's where the bag builder comes in because you're pushing your luck against that madness. You're trying to decide, should I do all these things or I could bust and I would lose everything, right? And also like what Axel says, the the whole, if you're not in the battle, you're not out of the game. You're, you're betting on who wins. Mm-hmm. And so you still care about what's going on. It's really great. Yeah, they have a really great interaction in that game because, as you said, I'm not uh, the very first round I did this foolish thing, which is I only went into one territory and tried to like 
go into that territory. But actually, um, that also showed me another part of the game, which is all the territories you're not in, you get to make wagers on who's going to win. And so I got to make all these wagers, which I did poorly at. <laughs> but anyway, it was a lot of fun. It was interactive, and I wanted to, and I cared so much. And you're building your bag, and I can already see next game I build the bag different, or I play this character, and there's asymmetry. There's building out on your board. So it was absolutely what this office likes, I think. Uh, especially because as we make flame bound, we have some elements of flame bound that use that board with some pieces on it mm -hmm. and you're managing that. And so I think we're going to see this game is uh, as a great example of sort of putting it all together really well. Yep. Um, so huge shout out to Wonderland's war. I am now it's, it, if we're doing top fantasy games, uh, it would be, you know, I, I it, it ha it's interesting because we, we we were talking about whether we we're going to do sci-fi or fantasy. It has Alice in Wonderland captured really well to me. Yeah. Oh yeah. I played the Cheshire Cat and I just loved. Like I really felt like oh I get to give you a little madness and it. Yeah. Like you almost feel like you're kind of part of that. Yeah. It was neat. I was the I was the Mad Hatter, so I, my special power was that I could have another round of tea, and I was just like, yes, we're having more yeah. tea. And then the, my powers were is I could make the tea hotter and hotter. So I was just loving the madness. It's like, yes, we're gonna have more tea. Um, so there was a brief shout out for Wonderland's More. That was what we were playing. But now we decided not to talk about fantasy because we were talking about sci-fi most of the time here. Because you come in with a sci-fi um, lean to I think your show has you in the background has you know you've got the Mandalorian you've got all the Star Wars figures. Yep. We're gonna dive deep into sci-fi now. We're gonna do our top five. We're gonna bring Rosie on. To uh, to see if we can we can get Rosie's top five as well. Welcome, Rosie. I'm gonna give a caveat that my top five are like potentially the only five sci-fi games that, that I own. <laughs> Easy to <laughs> pick a type of five when that's your five that you have. But we do have more like that I just haven't played yet, and that Doug plays a lot. My partner plays a lot more sci-fi than me, but I'm getting into it. <laughs> Yeah, I as as we mentioned at the top of the show, I it's not my favorite category, but I do buy a lot of games, so inevitably I end up with some. And then as we were going over, I was like, oh yeah, that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. Now we're we're not going to put on the list. At least I'm not. Rosie's allowed to because she's brand new at the company. She's allowed to put on our own games. We're not going to put on Mission Catastrophe, which is a sci-fi. So I never thought I would make sci-fi games, and we made Mission Catastrophe. It's me too. And in drama says we've made more <laughs> sci-fi here. I think it's evening out with Kurt Kitchens. 50-50 sci-fi at this company so far. But we're going to go top five. And um, I like to do, I don't know, it doesn't have to be ranked to five to one, but I like to do like five is, we're trying to rank them, right? right? Start with five and then one is our favorite amongst okay, those five. Okay, I think I know what my one is. Okay, so how do we gonna start? What are we going to do here? <laughs> have Rosie start. Rosie. Okay. Starting with my number five. You're number five. Okay. okay. Um, I have Moon Adventure, which I'm just is, actually hit the boxes. I don't have. We don't need the boxes. <laughs> Moon Adventure, okay, which is the co-op sequel to Deep Sea Adventure, oh. and um, it's very similar. You're sort of hopping down, like trying to catch up. Basically, what's happening is you crash landed and you're trying to gather resources to survive, and they're yeah. sort of scattered across the moon. And um, but you're trying to help each other gather those gain oxygen on the way, so it's quite different to Deep Sea Adventure, but it is really fun. And you know, I say I probably prefer Deep Sea Adventure just because it's you drown your friends, but um, <laughs> this, this is a really nice version. And I've seen that now people have like an oink game classic size version of it, so apparently, this mm. is maybe like the older version. I would like it if it was smaller, but that's just me, you know. Um, yeah, you, Deep Sea Adventure made me think, and we were talking a little bit before we started, like. Sci-fi could go anywhere, right? So you could say horror as a little, underwater could be a little sci-fi sometimes, like post-apocalyptic, you know, steampunk. So so sci-fi could go everywhere. But I'm glad they have one definitively that it's more sci-fi than deep sea adventure. Yeah, because <laughs> that would have been borderline, or not even that would have that would have been vetoed. Maybe right. I played deep sea. That looks fun. I yeah, that looks fun. I want to try that. All right, Chris, you are up with your number okay, five. Okay, uh, so my number five is I'm cheating right off the bat. Okay. And I'm saying Dinosaur Island slash Dulcar Island. Oh. So Dinosaur Island, if Our you're playing three or four yeah. players, if you're playing two player, do the Dulcar 
because it, Dinosaur Island isn't as good at two and Duel of Sword. They knew that, so they made Duel of Sword, right? Uh, mm. But it's it's kind of the same game. It's just a little bit different and stuff. Um, but Dinosaur Island, it's your Jurassic Park. We're cloning dinosaurs and stuff. Can't quite do it, so it's still sci-fi, right? <laughs> <laughs> Even though you've got dinosaurs Where from the discussion past. of like, if you can do it, Right, right now, then I guess it's not science fiction. Is right. science fiction always the future? We're really close. I think they're getting close to doing like a woolly mammoth. I can't <laughs> wait to see a woolly mammoth in my lifetime. I hope they make one. <laughs> I will fly to wherever it is to go. But see. there is in in Desert Island, there is that great like sciencey kind of feel yeah. with the tracks. Oh yeah, so, like, you start in a science lab. You're, you're doing rolling DNA dice and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that feels like yeah. that's science and goes into science. But you also get to build the park and have the people come in and get eaten in the park, which is great. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for some reason Brad's you keep definitively keep going. saying, definitely sci-fi. Definitely sci-fi. <laughs> oh, awesome. I will say also, uh, I'm glad Brad chimed in because when we were making Andromeda's Edge, I was a little worried because I wasn't sure I was a big, sci big, big enough sci-fi, but Brad is and Luke is and Maximus yeah. is and you are. So I was like, oh, I'm fine. And I'm I fine. think you are. Now, like every time I every time you say that, I'm like, but you like this and you like this and you like this and you're yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know why. By the so way, do the top five games have to be good? They have to be also good. <laughs> be good for you. <laughs> well, uh, yours not good. Well, I have. I'm like an. I'm going to just tell you an honorable mention. I'm not going to make it my five. Okay. Okay. But Firefly, the game, Ooh. is not good. No. But it feels very sci-fi to me like you're like if sure. they had nailed it i think it would have been i'm a huge brown coat a huge firefly fan and i do not like that game i i but. think that's why i'm gonna have to take it off uh, another honorable mention that i was talking to you about about the categories is manhattan project energy empire which luke made that feels like it kind of almost goes into the future with like the oil the nuclear mm -hmm. and everything like that Oh, we've got Moonrakers. Moonrakers. That could come up on a list. Let me tell you. All right, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna list those. I'm gonna list uh, Chimera Station as my number five. Oh. So worker placement game designed by um, Mark and Christina Major, uh, and developed by TMG and uh, Seth Jaffe did the development. It is a game where you have a station full of aliens, and you were doing worker placement. The station starts with nothing built, and then you have to build it out. And you decide what limbs and pieces you want on your workers, which gives you different powers. And then the station has powers, just it just blows up. I think Mark was going to make it seven rounds and had to cut it at five because the decision space at five rounds just blows your mind open. So Chimera Station feels very sci-fi with all the alien parts to it. Right. It's the only TMG uh, game I don't own and haven't played. Ah, I totally miss that one. Yeah, yeah. We should we should play that one because uh, I own it and that one's great. So we're going to Rosie's number four. Yes, it is really tenuous. So sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's roll camera. Wow. Movies. I would not have expected roll camera to be on a sci-fi because list. you can make sci-fi movies. You make movies, including sci-fi movies. <laughs> <laughs> nice um, connection. I like it's how a beautiful you game. There's literally like the, that, that, the that, insert. That, that the insert really is cool. like this Better is cool, like but the insert is like a film reel and wow. it's really funny and silly. Give them tons of theme points on that box. Yeah, I know. I love it. It's really cool, and you're sort of trying to get dice in the right places and get your lighting and everything and. And then you're completing scenes, but you need to make a really good movie or a really bad movie. So it's a cult movie. Otherwise, it's sort of in the middle. You're not going to get good points. Yeah, there could be is, some good cult sci-fi movies. Is the game you're just, <laughs> the whole game, you're making one movie? Yeah, but you're sort of okay. collecting the scenes <laughs> and you have goals. So trying to have funny, like it might be a rom-com or it might be mm. a sci-fi. <laughs> and you're trying to um, get the right types of scenes together. And then at the end of it, you tell the story. And they even give you little tiny props to put over the pictures to add in to it like to decorate it which is oh, really funny fun. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> ellie's well, laughing at me saying that that's probably not sci-fi but yeah, you know what i think <laughs> cult movies wow you can make a good sci-fi cult movie so i want to see your oh yeah sci-fi production all right chris your number four uh my number four is dark moon Ooh. uh so that, that's good. that's a game that started off um uh the designer created a uh, Battlestar Galactica game mm -hmm. and who's the bad guy, Cylons, blah, blah, blah. But of course he didn't have the license and I don't think he'd had anything published at the time. Uh, Evan, um, of course I'm going to blank out on his name. Um, 
Sorry, Evan. Uh, but <laughs> but, uh, but so he put it up on BGG, and then uh, Stronghold Games was like, "This is amazing," but they didn't have the IP, so they changed it into their own kind of like people on the moon. People get this uh, uh, disease that makes them want to like go around and destroy everything and stuff. So it's the traitors. Who's on the traitor thing? And uh, I don't normally like those kind of games, but you could play this game with like seven or eight people. Or, or even like four or five. But the mechanisms for it is like, everybody's just trying to keep the station going, but for some reason it keeps crashing and yeah. things are going bad and you don't know who's doing what. And it's you got to roll dice behind a shield and then go, oh, I didn't get any good dice, guys. Sorry. And they're like, yeah, right. But you really don't. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you did. You know, It's a great... Uh, it, and of course, you're a trope of different sci-fi people on the moon. Like one of you is an android. Mm. One of you is, you know... And you all have your own special ability doing that. And of course, if people don't trust you, they can put you... They can uh, quarantine you and then you don't get the help as much and stuff. Yeah. And you try to get, if you're the bad guy, you try to get the good guys quarantined. So uh, even re it, it's just yeah. really good. It's really that sounds good. good. That reminds me also of the thing I was wondering about, whether that robots automatically fell into sci-fi or not. Because obviously, you know, yeah. like you, you can, because I'm just going to give another example. I'm not going to name it as my number four, but like Robo Rally. It's, 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 you know, like, is that sci-fi? I don't know. Because it's Robo Wars is the thing, it's, right? I, yeah, it's a tough call yeah. about whether or not... We were talking about this earlier. It's like, it's really interesting that we're actually moving into a world where sci-fi films were, will, will become <clears throat> just normal dramas at some point. Like The Martian, right? It's yeah. a sci-fi because we haven't made it to Mars. But Once if you made get, it to Mars, it's yeah, a Yeah, in like Mars, a couple a, decades, it won't potato be a sci-fi anymore. Yeah, yeah. There'll be someone on Mars. It but they stopped making toy. Black Mirror because life was too accurate and so Charlie <laughs> Brooker was like right. there's you don't need me anymore you're already doing it <laughs> yeah so I'm not gonna put out Robo Rally though I do like that game a lot I'm gonna put because I want to have a Star Wars game on my list I do and I'm gonna put Imperial Assault as my next okay. one Imperial Assault is a game that because uh, I have played Outer Rim and I do like that one but I do like in Imperial Assault you get to like it just really feel, and I know some people would actually top sci-fi star wars one that i haven't played is um is it rebellion rebellion there's like a really Judah, good yeah, one yeah. where you're playing um, yeah. both sides but i like imperial assault because very first mission um you get like a lot of um cool fun minis but then you can like play and the first mission was like oh go rescue luke skywalker and then you get luke's card and you get to play luke and then darth vader comes in and you get to play these you get to really um i felt like they did a really good job at scenario based star wars right so you you play one scenario, it teaches you how the combat works. Then you play the next mm -hmm. scenario, it teaches you how the card play works. And then you then you get choices, like do you want to go rescue Chewbacca or do you want to go do something else? And then there's more minis you could buy for the game because, of course, uh, they figured out a way to monetize the hell out of that game. Oh, yeah. uh, so I didn't buy like everything, but I still have the little, um, the, you know, ATST walker. I have like one of the things on my book on my game shelves of like the pieces from that game were great it felt like it was in star wars and it felt like the whole sci-fi vibe to me so you know i've only played the game once i have the game but i only played it once and the first scenario they have you play like you said it kind of it teaches you combat but you don't really get to know all of it or no, really dive into it. keep it a mystery. Yeah, and so that's a fail for me because uh. then I didn't want to play a second half. I was like, <laughs> okay, I get it. It's a dungeon crawler. It's an interesting thing, challenge in games, me, yeah. which we also have this on Whisperwood, which is like, how do you present all the game at once to someone? Do you do an intro level? Do you do like it's going to happen in Flamebound 2 where we have to like kind of figure out like how do you mm -hmm. teach all this stuff at once, right? You got to make that first game really interesting enough to move on. I've... You can't just like you know. I felt like Imperial Assault did, and the reason why I thought they did is because the first one was so short, and they kind of just gave me a quick, like, open the door, get to this one mission, it was short, yeah, that's then true. play another one, and then they had already given me the Luke Skywalker card, so I was hooked. I was like, oh, let's go. It's one of the games I have on the <clears throat> Need to Replay shelf. My only downside to Imperial Assault, and the reason why I'm going to keep it at four, and the reason why that this actually informs something that Cardboard Alchemy believes in, they gave all the minis gray, and that is the part that... I look at those gray stormtroopers going, all I'd have to do is splash white on here. I painted mine. Oh, have you? I only played it once, but I painted it. <laughs> so I think as a result of playing that game, I said, you know what? 
I don't paint minis. I think dwellings of elder Minis should be color. I think they should be color. That's what I did after sort of like going out of that game was like, we shouldn't do color minis. That way you can just put them on the table and go. So, yeah. all right. Next three for Rosie. Interesting you say Star Wars. I'm not going to say a Star Wars game, but I have the only Star Wars game I've ever played is Star Wars Unlimited, the new TCG. <laughs> I don't think it's even out yet, but I have played that. Right. But, um, yeah. which is, it's good. Sure. I don't, I'm not a big, I only like Porgs and BB-8 as a yeah, sadly classic female fan of Star Wars. <laughs> really just those two things. Um just make a BB-8 game, just BB-8 the game. Uh, yeah, a little rolling around, like a, a planning robot game. Yeah. Anyway, it's nothing to do with Star Wars. Uh, my number three is Cosmoctopus. Hey, Ooh. another one that nice. was kind of like cult. Is that like that one, yeah. yeah, sci-fi? Yes. I mean, he's yeah. in space, right? It's space an it's octopus? a space octopus. Yes, one hundred percent. Totally sci-fi. Yeah. Yay! I got one. <laughs> um, that yeah, this is really cool yeah. in that you're trying to collect all of Cosmoctopus's eight tentacles so that he'll his body will plop into place. Uh, so it's kind of like the end of the game. He gets eight and he plops into place, but you're basically moving around this track of tiles, but they could be in different configurations, which is kind of cool. And you're picking up cards and resources, building up powers and cult abilities yeah. and bringing in tentacles. But it's really satisfying. And they have a plushie as well. Yes, they so do. Always a win. This is the deluxe one, so it's shiny. And apparently the inside yeah. is not closed in the dark, but I've never left it open to <laughs> absorb light. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, but it's really cool. Now, That's we've got nice. Paper Fort Games uh, watching yeah. well, Octopus. That's so great. I was just about to shout out Paper That's Fort great. Games because we partnered with them on Curter Kitchen to put Cosmo there into the Curter mm -hmm. Kitchen uh, Zoo Chef army that you can oh get. God. You can get Cosmo, and then Cosmo's power is any one of the other Zoo Chefs that comes out. And also, Paper Fort then went and actually they gave promo cards recently to the Dice Tower. So the Dice Tower's current campaign... Oh, look at that. It's really oh, funny when it's right. sealed. Yeah, yeah. Then you open the bag and it... it's kind of thematic. It just takes over. It's great. Um, it fills up her whole place when she opens it. Um, <laughs> but they paper for it, put promos on the dice tower for some Cosmo Octopus cards. And one of them is themed to Cardboard Alchemy's Potion, which is really oh, nice of them. Nice. So huge shout out to them. It's awesome. And glad it made your list. So we're on to Chris's number three. I saw uh, Ellie said in the comments that she has the old trivial uh, pursuit game, the Star Wars one. I have that one as well. Ah. But then the one that came after that with episode one, I also have because they have pewter oh, Darth Vader's and cool. R2-D2s and stuff like that to play the characters. That's nice. Uh, so what are we doing? Number three? Number yeah, three. Number three. Uh, so my number three. So this one. Is the is it sci-fi thing because it's mm. post-apocalyptic? Okay, uh, or maybe it's just dystopian future. Really, it's Euphoria. Oh, which is good pick. Uh, oh, thank you. So, uh, Stone Mayor Games. Um, it's a dice oh, worker placement game. Uh, yeah. There's not a ton of those that do it really well. This one does it really well, um, and it was uh, one of the games that inspired us to do bumping and. Uh, troubles because it's the first one I ever saw that had more replacement. Like you bumping. could, you yeah. could take someone out of a spot. Now yeah. his his bumping in Euphoria uh, is bad. Like when I bump you, it's bad for you. <laughs> oh, Whereas that was what I was saying. not in, done yeah, poorly. In troubles, we make it so if I bump you. it, it's good for you. Yeah, yeah. 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 But but uh, we were like, maybe we can twist this and change it. But anyway, uh, Euphoria is uh, it's like this dystopian future where you are. You're actually a bad guy. You play a bad guy, I think, hmm. in a way, because you are trying, trying to, to keep, keep the... your workers dumb so oh, that they don't yeah. rise up against you. And you're trying to uh, basically get the most out. Resources are <laughs> limited. There's only like, there's yeah. like four, there's like underground tunnels. There's yeah. a lot of cool stuff in that game. It really leans into the theme of, yeah, this is wacky. Like it had, um, you're trying to, just the resources weren't your typical resources that you see. Right. It, yeah. One of the factions is, is underground. And so they bring water to the other factions and one greets power. One makes peaches. I think it's peaches. Peaches. Yeah. <laughs> like one of the things peaches is like sci-fi. But one foreign. of the resources comes from the uh, blimps up above. It's called bliss. Uh, and it's just like yeah, a little yeah. green cloud or whatever. Uh, making me troubles. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, I mean, it's just a really great game. I think it's best at like four or five. Yeah. I think it plays up to six, actually. 
Um, but it's good to get a lot of people in it because once they have this one thing where you start putting down your workers to build a thing and the minute it fills up with workers, then it gets built and people get left out of it. Mm. So the minute someone puts one down, they go, oh, plans change, you have to get into it and stuff. So Stopian is a good sci-fi. There's so many things where you're like, oh, when our society gets controlled or there's like this whole like, oh, we're fighting against... Obviously, there's that Valerian movie, which wasn't that great, but it was like that whole like, hey, we're we're trying right. to like make our way through this whole weird. You always see those stories from the point of view of the people who are trying to rise up against those. Mm -hmm. You don't norm. And yeah, this, this game, one is like trying you're to keep playing everyone down. the people that yeah that yeah. It doesn't feel like you're being evil, but once you start dissecting what you're doing, you're like, oh, if my workers get too smart, they start rising up against me. Am I the bad guy? Am yeah. I the baddie? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the baddie. Yeah. That's uh, that's good. All right, now I have to go up with the number three. <laughs> oh, there's so many. See, this is funny because I said there weren't many, and now I have too many to put on there. Because I like, I was almost gonna put Cosmic Encounter because it's all this sci-fi, and I do like that one. It's player it's powers. Yeah, I'm not gonna put it though. I'm actually gonna give number three to Roy Kennedy with Last Light because Last Light. I immediately liked what he was trying to do in that game. Um, I played it recently. I've talked about it in that episode, but what it is, it's like trying to take a 4X game and put it in an hour. And to me, it also had a little bit of, um, it also had a little bit, Chris is getting the box, because he did the cover of this game. Uh, very well done. Uh, Last Light has a little bit of the, um, it's that game that I now can't think of. Uh, the Mediterranean, um, the ones where your cards, you you play cards until... Oh, Concordia. Concordia. Last Light has a little bit of Concordia, too, because you only have six actions, and when you start playing your actions, you have to then get your cards back. Mm -hmm. It has all of what I think sci-fi should have in terms of the theme is there, there's Last Light, there's one planet left, you're all circling around something, you got ships, you got technology, you got alien races, it's all crammed in there, from um, Gray Fox Games has a hit on their hands. They're doing another Kickstarter right now, or, or another uh, crowdfunding campaign on GameFound. It is, um, I lost terribly, but had an amazing time. Just kind of, it didn't feel like I was out of it because you're sort of determining your pace and you're trying to uh, see how fast you can race everybody else to the tech and the points, right? So I felt like, oh, I can still swing this. I sort of went heavy tech thinking I was going to come out of it with powers, but mm -hmm. that's just me and my, I want to play the long game every time. And That's it, exactly what happened to me on my first game. Yeah, it's not the kind, you, you need to go fast. It's 45 minute game. Yeah, yeah. You you start playing this game thinking, okay, I'm going to build up and all, like, no. as if it's like a three you hour race to the center and hold yeah. the center. A little bit like Brad and I uh, talked about it, like we like Nexus Ops. In Nexus Ops, you can control the center and you get powers when you control the center. This one has that a little bit as well. So it encourages, and the board rotates so that you can't do, because I might have listed Eclipse on this list, but I did not because the thing that I don't like about Eclipse, I still love that game, but it people turtle. They don't, yeah. they don't actually engage. You build up an army, you don't. So you build up a fleet and my fleet looks insane and your fleet looks insane and no one wants to attack because we don't know what's going to happen when we attack. That, you try to set it up so no one can get to you with the little yeah. hexes. <laughs> but in yeah. last light, you rotate right into someone's face and you have to go. You're like, okay, I'm so fighting you. And if you lose your ship, it's not that bad because you just spawn more ships and yeah. it really captured it to me. So that's my number three. Rosie, you're number two. Okay. Planet Before I bring this one up, just a, a fun fact about me is that I studied special effects for film and TV at university. That's what I studied. So I made props and stuff. I've made space okay. guns, that kind of stuff. My <laughs> dissertation was about the aesthetics of time machines. I am a huge Doctor oh, Who fan. Time machines. This isn't Doctor Who, but it's time. I'm obsessed with time travel stuff. So it's time stories, which you can't time really stories. see. Great game. Yep. Um, which Wonderful. I don't think of it as a board game. I think of it as a like cardboard console, because effectively you're plugging in to this sort of narrative of a time machine and you traveling th through loops effectively trying to fix stuff and correct things you're plugging in these stories so the game comes with a story um but you can get more and more of them i've not played as many as i'd like because it's potentially a four to eight hour game sometimes <laughs> yeah um, but i've always enjoyed the concept of you know trying to work out your best moves and you know some of my favorite movies are about 
reliving the same day and trying to figure stuff out. So oh, one of my favorite shows was Quantum Leap, and that feels like Quantum Leap the game. In the very <laughs> first episode, yep. you time travel back into these people, and then you're playing out their story. Um, really, I thought it was Groundhog yeah. Day, the film, yeah. the game. <laughs> Oh yeah, because yes. if you fail, you because if yeah. you fail, you have to start back over and go like, okay, we're doing that day again. I gotta go past this guard, do this thing. Yeah, yeah, but like some of the, some of them maybe are stronger stories than other. I think the one it comes with is really really good. Um, it's like Arkham Horror style one, and it's really cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, I'd love to play it more. Uh, it's one of those things you just need the right group, and that group needs to be so in love with it, you play it all the time. Yeah. So we have about five sealed. <laughs> One of the things I really liked that they did with that is they had different designers design different modules. So like if so when you're playing the one that's um the eighties one, it was designed by someone completely different. Yeah. And oh, the, then that was such a good one. They put um one of the things I really love is interactive storytelling where you put different decision trees. So mm -hmm. the person who built the eighties one literally built like you could go this way or you could solve the game this way. And oh my god, that was so cool. When they came yeah. out, the time story. Oh, sorry, what were you saying? Really? I was just gonna say, like for me, like Chronicles of Crime sort of replaced this a little bit, but it's not yeah, sci-fi. Just because you're able to like plug in a story, and they've got an '80s one that looks very Stranger Things. And uh, like cool. That. When so, they yeah. first came out with Time Stories, they actually uh, published, I think, on BGG, a way for people to make their own stories for it. Oh, that's neat. And I was so tempted to make Groundhog Day. Ah. Right, so that you could play <laughs> in Groundhog Day, that, oh, like some kind cool. of mystery yeah, was going some, on. Yeah, that'd be neat. And, and you just get really good at playing the piano and making ice yeah. sculptures. <laughs> yeah. By the way, two fun comments we had. Um, this may show up on our on someone's list, Planet Unknown. Uh, really great I game. Still need to play really that. great game. And then also Brad chimes in with Nexus Ops is a fun sci-fi game and inspired Rise of Tribes, which was Brad's yep. second published game. All right, your number two, sir. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So my number two, I'm going to join you in the Star Wars world. Of okay, course, I can't yeah. have this list without a Star Wars. <laughs> okay, game. all right. So yeah. what's my favorite Star Wars game? It is, well, unfortunately, Star Wars does not have a plethora of great games. Um, it, it, they have maybe 10% of all their games that come out are really good games. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are just IP grabs, in my opinion. You know, it's just subjective. But yeah. the one that really uh, grabs me is Outer Rim. And that's because it's a sandbox game. Yeah, You just go around, do whatever you want. Now, it does have the problem of every single sandbox game that either it's one hour long or seven hours long. <laughs> because the whole deal is you play until someone gets 10 fame. Well, if nothing goes anybody's way, nobody gets any fame. Yeah, but one person might just hit everything they need and get fame right away. So it's it's swinging in time like that. So you got to just make it your day to kind of yeah. jump into that. The yeah, only yeah, sandbox game I played is Hamlet, and I think they do have a way that they kind of sort of force indeed. you eventually to build the church, uh, which is quite good. Yeah. Oh, I've never had a Hamlet game last longer than a couple of hours. I don't think that's cool. I need to look at that. I because uh, I'm designing one, of course, but uh, <laughs> it, trying to figure out ways to. Uh, mitigate that big swing weird stuff that happens uh, in Sandbox. But, you know, I the, my first game I played, I was Boba Fett and I went around and I grabbed, uh, you know, people. I found the bounties I was hunting for and, you know. I got to play. Yeah. The first time I played was Han Solo and I was going to do the Kessel Run. And I was oh, yeah. like, oh, this is so you cool. The Kessel Run. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, they put this in here. Yeah. I, I should have listed it, but I didn't because I've only played it I played it one time, hmm. so I kind of felt like, wow, I guess I can't really call that one of my faves if I haven't gone back. But I would like to play it again. Maybe I need to give it more. And it also feels like this big, epic game, so it makes me, it hard to return to it because you're like, oh, do I want to get onto it? But the minute you get into it, you're like, oh, it's just Did they do an expansion? Yeah, there's okay. a new expansion. I haven't played it yet. Okay. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe we should get, I should get back in because that was fun. Yeah. Uh so with my kid yeah. too. He likes Star Wars a lot and Outer Rim feels like yeah, it's got all that thematic. It's, it's such it. a good story. They have one of my best mechanisms in it that I'm gonna steal someday, which is um if you go on missions, right? You know how like everything in these games they have challenges. So like, oh, I roll this to see if I beat it. So in their missions, just one card, it's like Roll to see if roll your sneak to see if you could get past the guards. Uh, yeah, and if you yeah. don't do it, it says go to the next line, and now you have to fight guards. Uh, but if you do do it, you get to skip that line, and now <laughs> you're in the thing, and you do. It's a little mission oh, that I you like actually that yeah. enjoy. Like it's a story that just happens to you yeah, right there. Right. And it's and you could 
utterly fail and go, okay, I have to run away and then come back. I love <laughs> so, I love when games come up with stories at the end. Like I did this, yeah. I this happened. But this is like one turn. You just do one thing and yeah. now I went in there, I stole the gym, I got it. <laughs> So Mark, you just yeah. sold Mark on it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> now sold. you can play the whole game without doing missions. You could just go for bounties or something like that. So I usually play Doctor Afra because her whole thing's missions, and I love uh, that aspect of cool. it. Cool. So, Good yeah. tip there. All right, number two for me. Uh, this was hard too because Brad was in the office and we were talking about sci-fi games, and so. <laughs> He reminded me that we used to play Race for the Galaxy all the time. I'm not going to list that as my number two, but it would seriously be up there. I like how you keep sneaking games. I am. In. He's he's sneaking, like, games. Ten extra games. Yeah, like, he's yeah. sneaking one. <laughs> Here's one I'm not saying. Yeah, I love Race for the Galaxy, but what I'm going to do for my number two is put it a game that kind of in recent years has been on my top. I really like this game. I love how it feels. It's Beyond the Sun. Beyond the Sun feels very sci-fi to me because you get these little cubes that have astronauts and ships on them. It feels te it's a tech tree. The game, basically, you you you're a corporation and you and you um, look at that. Ellie shouted it out as well. You land and you're trying to uh, build. So you've got two kind of ways to play. One is you go into space and you can shoot around and land on planets and. Uh, kind of colonize or get you get your s s establishment on these planets. The other one is to go tech trees where you're like, I'm going to research this science or this military tech or this whatever. And each of the tech trees kind of brings in a little bit of um, uh, it's a little flavor in terms of like, oh, this uprising or this thing happens or robots or you can go down an all AI tech, tech tree or whatever. It feels... Um, it definitely feels like sci-fi. It definitely feels like, as far as a like gameplay to me, my kind of, this is where I was also struggling is, and this is going to go into my number one pick, is thematic sci-fi versus like functional. So like, hmm. like okay, so Beyond the Sun doesn't, it's like not overly dripping with theme. So like, so so I was struggling with that because of course, um, just to give that example of Ratio of the Galaxy, it felt like, well, this is just a card game. I mean, it is sci-fi, but it's also sometimes it's hard to see. Like, is it said as it doesn't have? It, yeah, you have to you have to take one more step into it by right. reading. Like, oh, I just got androids, which is allowing me to do this, and then yeah. you have to kind of imagine it in your head. So, kind of Beyond the Sun to me was a little bit of struggle because it doesn't feel as thematic, doesn't feel as like deep into it, but it definitely is sci-fi because I feel like. I mean, the title Beyond the Sun, it feels like it's already going out into space and you're developing tech and a lot of the tech is tech we don't have. So I feel like it is. So oh, sci-fi. Yeah. Well, there's also the <coughs> ships colonizing. It does have ships and, and planets. Like yeah, so yeah. I feel like that we did a poll on Andromeda's Edge. I wish I had that pulled up right now where we said, what makes a thing sci-fi? Is it robots, aliens, spaceships? Like, what is yes, it? Yes, yes, yes. All of the above. <laughs> yeah, you have to have everything. <laughs> but anyway, definitely has spaceships. Um the funniest thing about it is its components. Beyond the Sun has these like little cubes. They're kind of fun only only because also they feel very. Um, the cubes also kind of add to the atmosphere of it, mm -hmm. and the cubes um, you don't roll them like dice. You actually turn a face to be like, it's a crate or it's a person or it's a ship. <laughs> they feel like oh, I'm just turning this guy in. For, he's going back into crate mode. I mean, um, I imagine one of your favorite parts is that you have a different ability per player, right? Player you, abilities. You do have player I powers as a, as a, each corporation can have uh, different uh, powers to it. Sci-fi sci movies. <laughs> Look, okay, so we are on our number one picks now. <laughs> Will anyone nice. overlap? So far we haven't overlapped. Will anyone be surprised at anyone's number one? We'll see what happens with Rosie's number one. My, my number one... Okay. Is Andromeda's Edge. <laughs> oh, look at this. Nice. It's so Edge. I'm obviously intensely biased here at this point, but um I've actually like surprised how much I enjoyed it. As someone who's a cozy gamer, I don't get the opportunity to play three hour games very often. Um amazingly, that's not something I tend to have too much spare time for. <laughs> but I've gotten the opportunity to being that was sort of testing and checking stuff. And um, yeah, like it's 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 really fun. Like I was really surprised at how much I enjoyed. Well, both times I've been dragon, so that definitely helps. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I ease into the sci-fi, yeah. But I also the way that I play games is by the seat of my pants. I have no strategy until it sort of appears to me randomly throughout the game, and I quite enjoy that. Sort of as you're playing, you go, "Ooh, 
let's smell let's let's do that and let's do this which is quite enjoyable um whereas some games for me i have to from the beginning have a plan and that's just not how my brain works so i quite enjoyed that when i won the last one i was just like that just sort of just happened because luckily that module was out and i had the ability to get a lot of resources i mean i had a little bit of a plan but i didn't really know what was going to happen because you never know really like, who's going to get in your way or go off the same tracks or anything ali wants but, to play you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i, I we keep saying Chris, like... we were, Chris was challenging because we were saying, Chris, <laughs> while we've been working on this game, we've all been excited to play it. And it's really telling to me, uh, this happened on Dwellings too, when you play the game and you're just that addicted to it. So Chris is like, I want to play this game again. I want to play this game again. And I showed it to Rosie. And so it's great to hear that you liked it and that it's starting to eat away at your brain and go like, ah, I want to play. There's types of sci-fi I enjoy and it feels more um, like Marvel, colorful, like crazy different aliens than it is you know cold hard space survive yeah, like, we're not you know, doing for me I, I like the martian and stuff like that i do but that's because it's got it's got a sense of humor you know potatoes um but you know there's an element yeah. of uh when it's like a little bit more chaotic i mean lauren was playing these blorps is that right are they yeah blorps? the techno blorps techno blorps. i think i called them something else wrong <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I just love that you know you're imagining them sort of blobbing around space and then plushy dragons and you know yeah. there's a lot of puns and there's these really fun little details in the art that I keep trying to find that Chris has added into the modules like sort of silhouette style I'm like where's the TARDIS <laughs> like I'm trying to find things there is one with yeah. a TARDIS <laughs> there is so for everyone who like gets that, um, Andromeda's Edge down the road uh, there's 172 modules that you can acquire um, depending on if you got the package that includes extra modules Chris put different art on all of them and put lots of Easter eggs to sci-fi things in there. There's uh, sci-fi references to the Terminator. There's sci-fi references to uh, Superman. There's references to um, lots of different things. There's the TARDIS is in there. There's the um, Chronicles of Riddick. There's I just play, I played one the other day where it was like an Infinity module where you had like the Infinity Gauntlet uh, stones yep. in them in there. So there's like so many cool things in there. There we go. Is this a distraction uh, method, Chris, so that when you play people, they're all going to be going, ooh, and like, ah, and you're going, uh-huh, yeah. No, yeah, because I'm the know. one going, oh, I remember doing it. I'm the one being distracted by it, yeah. <laughs> uh, Michael throws out a uh, read the rules for On Mars, was amused to say the rules for the first players is the one who most recently watched The Martian. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I actually won the Wonderland's War one was who had just had, had tea last. So I was like, yes, I'm in. <laughs> Uh, all right, so that was your number one. Thank you for for picking Andromeda's Edge. We do hope it does make it out of people's number ones. It is trying to be that colorful, little bit of everything sci-fi, so that you don't feel like oh, this is um, it should never be boring. Let's put it that way. Um, all right, Chris, your number one. Yeah, um, I will we'll, honestly Andromeda will be my number one, but because I worked on oh, it, I left it off. Nice. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, Dwellings has been in my top ten. Sure. And of course, well, that's I worked really on that one an too. Honor as well. And so Andromeda is just right above dwellings okay. for me. So it's got to be in my top 10. So of course it would be my number one. But leaving that out. Um, so my number one is Merchants of Venus. Ooh. And I have not played this one. You haven't played this one? No, oh, I haven't. Oh, we need to play this game. Okay. Um, the great thing. So it's a big pick up and deliver like, oh, these people over here want weird they all have funny technologies there's these different aliens around the galaxy okay. and stuff um and so you go okay these people want to buy tv shows that's what humans make <laughs> they, these aliens want tv shows but humans want you know weird furniture from the centaur people and stuff like that mm. like it's got all this goofy stuff to it but the best part of it is that when you go to a planet you don't know what aliens are there yet mm. and so you flip over the alien you meet them they give you a little spending money, so you get some free stuff from them. And then suddenly the market changes. Huh. And so it, it has that exploration. I love the exploration to it. The only thing I'm not crazy about, which most people complain about, is that traveling, you have to do all this dice work. And to get new technology from all these different people, you mitigate that dice. But at the beginning, you're just like randomly being flung around the galaxy. <laughs> and it's like, oh, that's not crazy fun so it's one of the few games where we have one little house roll and I'm, i i try to stay away from house rolls and stuff but it's it's just so that you don't get flung off yeah, yeah, wildly yeah. And it stuff sounds like that. fun though it yeah, is I like really exploration fun. too yeah, that's yeah that, my... exploration is my favorite part because it's like it might not be my best move to go see who's at that planet 
I might have all the stuff to go over here, but I got to go see who's at that planet. Mm -hmm. But it's it's always fun. I do love exploration in uh, games. I think if I was at one downside with the Dwellings and Andromeda for me is that we didn't get to have a lot of exploration. There's a more exploration in hmm. in Dwellings than there is in Andromeda. But unfortunately, putting that mechanism just took the game too far. Like, you know, you too long and too drawn yeah. out. We had to like take the exploration down to a very little bit, but like um, there are games where you get to go like, Oh, what is over here? Uh, it's a little bit in last light too, where you like, you don't know what is that love that there's a token. So you, you are pushed to go out there. And right. It, exploration result like in Forex games, which is exploit, exploration, expand and exterminate, exterminate. <laughs> yeah. The, the explore X. is always like the weakest one for all of these games for me. It's like, oh, take yeah. a thing and flip it over. And Explore is one of my favorite things in the game. I think it's which because is why of, this is I think it's because of the length of time and what it adds to the game is that in the early versions of Dwellings, we had this thing where no board was there. And you had to go like, what's here? What's here? And then when you found it all, you're having a worker placement game. But the right. problem is that just it took, it just a adds a whole bunch. So you're just like, oh, let's just put the board out. Yeah. Um, we all know how long Coxon takes to play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I want to play Merchants of Venus now. That's fun. So my number one. Let's see if you guys... I don't even think anyone could have guessed this title, not even myself, until I made this list. But this has to be number one, which is really weird that I'm going to say this. It's Twilight Imperium 4. Wow. I cannot believe I'm putting it on, because it's not even one that I own, and I've played it one time. But I'm telling you, if there's the essence of a sci-fi game, it has to be this one. This one plays, the game I played was 12 hours long. Not kidding. It was insane. Uh, someone who had played it before did something really cool. And if you ever play it, I highly advise this. It was really interesting. He got six people who know the game really well. And he had six people who have never played the game. And he put us all on teams. So I was oh. on a team with someone who already knew the game really well, was doing all this stuff. And he made another rule, because the game can take a long time, although it took forever still, is that the game never stopped and someone always had to be at the table. So I could go take a bathroom break, but my partner was there doing the things or he could go get lunch and That's I was smart. still there. So that game has negotiation. It has commerce. It has flying to new planets. It has building armies. It has everything. It has races of weird ass creatures you've never seen before. It feels like the epitome of sci-fi to me. Um, I'm not uh, sure that I'm up for a 10 hour game all the time. And I would like to play it again, but it's kind of intimidating to see the, how long it takes. But I will also say that Luke, when he was making Drama's Edge with Maximus, he was like, if I can give something that feels like it has all the kitchen sink parts of Twilight Imperium and put it in a Euro box for people, then I will also have done what I want to do is give people a version of Twilight Imperium and a, like a lesser package, you know? I feel like if you look at Last Light, as Roy's trying to go, let's give it to you in an hour. The trend these days seems to be away from the really long, drawn-out thing. But if you want to play the really long, long drawn-out thing, I feel like Twilight Imperium, an afternoon of that, a themed game night of that, feels like, let's go. Let's discover the galaxy. Let's build trade routes. Let's figure out how we're going to fight. The The race that I... The faction I played was like... Um, I think we were like merchants where we like if someone traded with us, they did better. And so we were kind of making deals. And the very savvy person that I had on my team was like cutthroat, just chopping people down at the knees. And I was like, he didn't mean I was like the PR person. He was like, no, 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 no. Just ignore that last thing he did. No, we're serious about this trade. This is a, our number one obligation is to you. And then he would just be cutthroat out there. I was like, I'm so sorry. I didn't tell him to do that. You good cop, bad copping. <laughs> yeah, we did good, good cop, <laughs> bad funny. cop in Twilight Imperium. It was a lot of fun. And so I think that game just on its epic scale alone has to be up there. I'm going to invalidate my entire list by admitting the deep, dark secret I've never played. Uh, oh, man. I want to. Definitely yeah. want to. But like you said, it's, it's an, an entire day. It's an entire day. And I don't know anybody that has a game. Yeah. I played Seventh Continent and it was 20 hours. Um, over two days, so we played it, and then we, when you, we, want. you can save it, the game. Yeah, <laughs> so, we, so you can save it, but it takes you back to a certain point, and we yeah. didn't like that we yeah. would lose. So what we did was we left it out, went to bed, and the next day we finished it. Wow, we were staying at our it's friend's an place. Interesting point about Seventh Continent. We were debating if that was sci-fi because we, I don't know the ending to it. 
I don't know if it feels like Lost Planet where you kind of run into these weird things is more fantasy to me. Yeah, I only played a little bit into it, so I don't know. But, but it is on BGG as sci-fi. There's so also, I believe, be in the first scenario, you find like a ship possibly. I've literally played oh. one 20 hour session, and then my friend has all of it. And we're yeah. like, we just, you have two children. We now have a dog. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, get those big ones in. Yeah, for sure. So we don't have a lot of time, but I've been noticing that people have been shouting out some, like, I almost put Space Space mm -hmm. on there. It was another agony of, Space Space is really good, but it doesn't feel, it feels like I'm playing a really great engine, but I don't know that it matters if it's sci-fi. Right. That's why I didn't put Space Space, but I love John Clare's game. Um, I think it's a good... Cryo's mentioned. Cryo's mentioned? Nice. Yep. Cryo's good. Cryo. Mark shouting out a Luke Laurie game. He actually made those mechanisms in Cryo before he made Dwellings, and so it has that same kind of DNA. Um, Paperfoot really games. Awesome. Cryo, Always. by the way. I want to do a shout out to Cryo's art style and really feels like, oh, I'm landing on a planet and it's freezing over and there's lots of cool ships and yeah, bugs. That I can't remember his name. It's like a French name of an artist that does that kind of style where it's like like lightly thin pen ink. Yeah, and then the colors really good. Are vibrant. Yeah, it's great. Paper Forge shouting Star Realms. That's uh, oh, yeah. a really great one to mention because it has that, uh, it definitely feels sci-fi and it has all that quick hit in a card game. So mm -hmm. as far as bringing in that theme, you can bring in the types of cards that give you more uh, planets or shields or you can play another one. Um, that is more weapons. That's a great, great example. I've never played abduction. So this this sounds like a me game. I've seen people and it's this weird like silicon spaceship that you reach into to get ducks out of. Is this, is this correct? <laughs> like, I've seen the it all light. over like, TikTok. That sounds like a great, a weird. Uh, great one. Mm -hmm. Oh man, how did I not think of Galaxy Trucker? Oh, I totally forgot. Galaxy, Galaxy Trucker, Trucker is a fantastic I mean, game. I had a whole list that I had to yeah, I get know. through to get to down to five, and I didn't even put. All right, so I'm going to say that I've realized I do like sci-fi games. I just I realized I now. The, whoops. The shiny deluxe Doomlings, which is kind of sci-fi because you're basically making these microbes or weird little blobs of before the world ends. Um, mm -hmm. But it's very very fancy. I like the uh, deluxe Doomlings. Ones. Yeah. Yeah. I originally had Scythe in here. Oh, because Scythe it has mechs. It's an alternate history with different. Science. I would not have thought of Scythe as sci-fi because, yeah. of course, you feel like you're in rural fields. Right. But it has mechs, and it is so. You know, it is in like like 1920s or something. But an like alternate that. 1920. Alternate 19 where uh, like alien rocks have hit the ground. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. I also, by the way, last on last episode, I shouted Galactic Cruise, which is coming to mm. Kickstarter. I want to play that. Definitely could be in my top sci-fi games because you know you're going out into space in a really fun way, putting on. There's you know there's a one of the modules you can build on your ship is a board game convention that you can put on your <laughs> rocket. I think it's hilarious. That's funny. Yeah. Oh my goodness! It sounds like Wally. -E. You know they will set off and end up. <laughs> we got a shout out for Voidfall. Uh, Voidfall definitely looks impressive. I need to play that. Um, big, big game, right? Oh man, I thought, forgot about Anachrony. Oh my god, there's just so oh, many I games. have it on here. Yeah, I, I just um, had to get rid of it. Uh, uh, I got asked about, I think Axel asked me about uh, the ISS Vanguard. I have not gotten to play it yet because I had to come ISS, here. So. <laughs> ISS Vanguard would. If I if I was to, so that same reason why I put TI four on the top, I think I would put ISS Vanguard near the top if I had wow. played it because I feel like it captures yeah. that whole explore, make a journal, go uh, maybe the planet's horrible and right. you're gonna die. Uh, ooh, Unsettled is another one that should probably be on that. here because it has that like mystery of space, yeah. right? Like that I don't know. What's going to happen? I saw Starship Captains mentioned, by the way. That's a really great kind of, uh, um, I, not gateway. It's a little further than gateway, but it's a it's a good game to jump into and uh, enjoy. And it's, of course, leaning towards Star Trek. Thank you, Ellie, for putting all the sci-fi games. We could obviously continue this conversation because clearly oh, we've all discovered sci-fi games are great. Uh, Mar Michael shouted out Unsettled as well. 
if we do this for like fantasy, we're going to have to block in a full hour just for it because yeah. you don't even know if you like sci-fi and this took. <laughs> yeah. um, so if we do fantasy, which is most of my collection. <laughs> yeah, we'll do another top. This was a lot of fun. I definitely understand why the top five lists are, are fun to do. Uh, so we'll have to do another one for fantasy and a little bit for just certain mechanisms. We almost then, could have done one. And cozy. Top. Top, top five cozy games. We can yeah. do top five this year, the dragon. We can do top five dragon games. Oh, I did one of those. Did you? Did, yeah. Oh, cool. That's nice. We're going to have to play Wormspan first before we can do that one. Yes, we're going to have to know. Uh, Brad says the top 87 fantasy games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, well, we're still, you know, Chris is here. We're hanging out. We're going we're gonna to go into more dev and design work today. Um, if anyone has any more questions, we'll answer them. Otherwise, we'll let everyone take it to the Discord and we'll chat with you another time. Uh, we also have, by the way, another special guest coming to the studio tonight. Luke Laurie and Maximus are visiting to show us their next game. So it's like so cool. Um, this weekend, I'm running uh, playtesting in our local game store. We're going to be playtesting Flamebound. We're going to be playtesting play a new game by Peter C. Hayward. And we're going to play this game by Luke and Maximus plus Whisperwood testing for sure. Yep. Um, is the is the new game by Luke and Maximus sci-fi? I think we would put that in fantasy. Oh. I think we would put that oh, in fantasy. That's three fantasy you just mentioned. <laughs> by the way, nobody mentioned Apiary because I have not played Apiary, but Bees in Space it. sounds amazing. I, I love and I Bees. Definitely... And yeah, I haven't played it yet. Bees in Space, got to play it. I tried to play it at BGG and that got cable was just... Yeah. covered every minute yeah gotta see what that one's all about as well it's a big category i remember when we launched um uh, mission catastrophe that day asking for troubles with this expansions <laughs> yep. went up on kickstarter so we were head to head and also there were three other sci-fi games that same mm -hmm. day launched you and i stomped them yeah we did we, took we them teamed out. up yeah we yeah. took them out yeah <laughs> nicely done um, all right, that was a lot of fun. I'm glad that you could uh, join us and that we could go through all that. Everybody who is catching this late, don't forget to go to the Letter Tycoon. Um, play for the green team. Help them win. Help them get a good word so you could also win a copy of Letter Tycoon. Green team. And we'll be playing some, possibly playing some Letter Tycoon in our Discord. We also have our Discord is good for just you can strike up any game night, get some BGA games with other people, and can get a bunch of sci fi games going on. Mark's like, where will the conversation with Luke and Maximus be? Well, they're coming to our studio at uh, Cardboard Alchemy um, to show us, to pitch us a new game. And uh, we will be very interested to see how that goes. Luke's got tons of great ideas. Uh, Maximus as well. And so it's kind of a... You're not recording it, though. No, we're not recording yeah. it. It's it's off the books till, till we sign it. And obviously, if, if we like it, we'll be telling you a lot more about it. And I pretty much like all the games, Luke. Like, I almost signed... I, I told Luke when I played Cryo the first time, I would have signed it in a second. I, I really... It was called something else then. I think it was called something about Jupiter, Beyond Jupiter. It was called something. Hmm. And I really liked it. And he said, I'm sorry, this is already taken, but I will make you what turned out to be Dwellings. So that was fine by me. Yeah, that worked. You know, it worked out fine. Um, I won't be hanging out with them because of the distance, but I will be making a pin board for these pins and there will be a TikTok about how to do that. Yeah, so Rosie's been nice. doing TikToks. The TikToks have been going really well. I think that um, now that we get you more into Andromeda's Edge, eventually the TikToks will be like, you know, we have to do something with sci-fi. Uh, I'm ready, we... I got my space top on today. There you go. I'm dressed like space. Oh, cool. You there don't you even to see blend me right in now. Our background. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we don't have any pins right now that are sci-fi, so you're going to revert back to our fantasy pins. I could probably there. find one. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Uh, Mark, you have all of Luke Laurie's designs. That's amazing. Do you even have? I think I do too. The first one he did was called um, the Small Box. One, it was right? a Small Box yeah. one. Uh, what was that game called with Jeff? With the gems in between the cards. Yeah, yeah. The tarot card one. Oh, I still have it too. Um, I will tell you, um, 
I know. And then Jeff uh, Cornelius is going to be like shouting at the screen yeah, if you watch it. Yeah. Stones of Fate. Stones thank of Fate, you, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Uh, so Luke made this game called Stones of Fate, and it was a mini game inside another game. And it was like he published the card game mini game. And thank you, Mark yeah. does have it because Mark's also got it. Um, fun fact, Mark, that I'll tell you. Luke and I used to design all the time around that same time, and I was starting to figure out. We, we wrote for the League of Game Makers. Chris was in the League of Game Makers. Brad was in the League of Game Makers. And Luke was posting different game topics. And Luke made, speaking of sci-fi, a game at that time, which was my absolute favorite of any game of his I've ever played. And that includes Dwellings and Andromeda's Edge. Wow. This game was you're playing, because uh, Luke is a big sci-fi person. And so it was um, Blade Runner and themed. Okay. So this game was, you didn't know if you were human or if you were a replicant. Oh, and sure. as you were playing the game, you were doing these different actions and you started to discover, oh my God, I'm I'm a replicant. Like, I, like it was so good. And Luke was making it kind of, it kind of went party. And I think he decided, I think I'm just better at worker placement. I'm going to drop the game. And I told him that someday I, I kind of want to take that game back and figure out how we can make that game. Because the discovery of who you were while you're playing a, a hidden goal, like you're trying to figure out if you want the water tower to be shut off and you're like, the humans want the water tower to be on, but am, am I, do I want the water tower? Like you don't know if you want the thing. So that was really good. So when you're walking through the desert, you find a turtle <laughs> that's face up, but you're right. not. Right. Why aren't you helping it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Um, so Luke's games are great. We'll uh, we'll be playing some more with him. We're also going to be playing, like I said, we're going to do a little whisper one. Can't wait to talk more about that as well. Yep. So all these things uh, in future chats and on our Discord. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Cheers. Thank you, Rosie, for everything you're doing. Have a good weekend, everybody. And Bye. definitely game on.